Hello, and thank you for watching. My name is Bradford Roberts, principal broker, founder, and owner of TR Realty in the Las Vegas area. After watching this video, please be sure to like it as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. Download the pertinent handouts for this video by clicking the link in the comments below. Now let's get started. I'd like to begin this segment by talking about the uh, types of leasing that we generally find around Nevada. Now keep in mind that a lease could take any format uh, or version that the two parties, lessee and lessor, agree to. Uh, but I want to discuss some of the more commonly used types of leases in our area. Uh, the first one that I'd like to talk about is known as a full gross lease. A full gross lease is one where the tenant is paying a certain amount of money uh, for the space and the owner is carrying all the expenses behind the scenes. So this is very predictable for the tenant uh, because the costs are not going up or down. Uh, they know exactly how much their rent is going to be every month. So things like property taxes, the uh, property insurance, operating expenses of the property, these are all carried by the owner. Uh, so it is the owner taking the risk um, about those expenses. A full gross lease, as I mentioned, does provide that predictability and stability to the tenant. However, the full gross lease is typically the most expensive lease for the tenant. Uh, then we have one known as a single net lease. A single net lease also shifts most of the costs of operating the property to the property owner with the exception of the property taxes. The property taxes are typically prorated by square footage and passed on to the tenant. So in addition to the monthly rent, the tenant would be paying his share, again, based on the square footage of the property taxes. Um, typically, property taxes increase every year, and not always, but typically they increase, which would mean that the tenant's prorated share would likely increase as well. Then we move on to something known as a double net lease, where not only is the tenant paying his prorated share of the taxes, but he's paying his prorated share of the insurance for the property as well, with all the other costs being uh, taken care of by the landlord. And then lastly, we have one that is very common uh, known as the triple net lease. So the triple net lease actually provides the lowest price per square foot because expenses are going to be billed separately. And we refer to this as CAM. CAM, which stands for Common Area Maintenance. So in this situation, the tenant is going to pay a price per square footage in rent, and then based on the uh, square footage that the tenant occupies, he will pay his share of the taxes, he will pay his share of the insurance, he will pay his share of all other kinds of operating expenses for the property as well. And that could include cleaning, landscaping, electricity for common areas, trash, water, security, and even property management. So the way that's calculated is the landlord would take all of those bills, whichever bills he wants to include, and he would divide those bills by the square footage of the entire property or uh, complex or development, what have you, and then multiply by the number of square footage that any particular tenant is occupying. So they would pay their prorated share of all of those expenses. And that's something I mentioned earlier. When we're driving down the street and we see a sign that says $1.50 a square foot on this property and $2 a square foot on that property, uh, we, we typically can't tell by the sign whether we're looking at a triple net, double net, single net, or full gross uh, kind of lease. So that's why I would be a bit uh, reticent to simply compare the price per square foot without knowing that we're also comparing uh, the type of lease that the tenant would enter into. Uh, there's something else known as a percentage rent. 
This is a little difficult to explain, so try to follow me here. But when you get into more upscale developments, when you get into anchor tenants, when you get into typically shopping malls, landlords ask for something known as a percentage rent. And for you to understand the concept of percentage rent, you also have to know the term break point. So break point is a point under which a tenant is simply paying their rent over which they are paying their rent plus a percentage of their sales. So the break point is something that is completely negotiable. And of course, the break point would vary by the, the type of business. So let's say you're dealing with a mom and pop little pizza shop. You guys can tell I like pizza, right? So a little mom and pop pizza shop, we might have a break point of let's say a million dollars in sales. So if that pizzeria sells less than a million dollars worth of pies, what that means is they're simply gonna pay their rent. But if their sales exceed that million dollars, then they're gonna pay their rent, but they're also gonna pay a percentage, typically one, two, three percent, somewhere in there, somewhere in there of their sales. Some landlords will spend money to actually promote an entire property, a mall or a shopping center or something like that. And you might think, you know, that's pretty nice of the landlord to promote the whole property. But typically when you see a property promoted like that, it's because the tenants are paying some sort of a percentage rent once they pass their, um, their break point. Um, I wanna talk about rent abatement abatement, A-B-A-T-E-M-E-N-T. -E -E rent abatement is just a fancy way of saying free rent. And sometimes we can get rent abated during the build out process or the licensing process um, so that the basically the landlord is working with the tenant. If the tenant is not able to operate the business because they're not up and running yet or they're not properly licensed, they might not be paying rent during that time. So that would be uh, one, one example of rent abatement. Um, also, rent abatement could simply be a negotiation. You might negotiate with a landlord. Um, listen, I understand you're looking for a three-year lease. I'll give you a five-year lease, but the first month of every year of that lease is going to be abated. Um, perfectly fine if that's what the parties agree to. Also, some landlords have insurance to protect against that kind of abatement. Um, rent could be abated in some cases if there was work being done on the street in front of the uh, shopping center or what have you that would reduce vehicular traffic coming in. Might be unattractive for a while. Rent could also be abated in the case of a natural disaster, uh, something like a hurricane or an earthquake coming through that maybe does some damage to the business or the business has to close for a certain period of time. Um, rent abatement can happen with accidents as well. Um, you know, uh, some crazy examples, right? If a, a car uh, drives through the front window of a business and they have to shut down for a while, or if there's a car accident that knocks down a utility pole and there's no electricity for a couple of days, the landlord might abate the rent in those cases. So I want you to be familiar with that term. I want you to be familiar with automatic rent increases as well. Now in residential real estate, typically when someone leases a property, a house or a condo, uh, typically the rent is the same thing throughout the duration of the lease. But in commercial real estate, uh, leases are typically longer and therefore they often have automatic rent increases. Again, this is something that is completely negotiable but we could have a situation where the first year of the lease, the tenant is paying X amount of money every month. The second year, it goes up a couple of points, uh, that sort of thing. Completely negotiable, but kind of standard practice in a commercial lease. I wanna talk about TI. TI is tenant improvements, something that is also completely negotiable with a landlord and can vary based on market conditions. So when we talk about tenant improvements, we're talking about a landlord who's willing to spend some amount of money to do repairs, to do alterations, uh, renovations to the particular space. And this can take a couple of different uh, forms. Uh, one is 
the landlord could simply give the tenant money for the tenant to do his own renovations in the space. Or we could negoti negotiate for the landlord to actually do the work. Now, sometimes when you go into a new space, you might negotiate for painting, carpeting, maybe some walls to be moved, uh, all kinds of things like that. So those are all known as tenant improvements. Now, when you've got a situation where there's a lot of space available, you can assume that the landlord's going to be a lot more willing to do tenant improvements, right? But if you've got a shopping mall with 150 stores and 149 of those stores are occupied and there's one store left, chances are that landlord is not going to be willing to do much in the way of tenant improvements. And also, not only are tenant improvements typically dependent on market condition, but they also can depend on the length of the lease. In other words, the longer commitment you're willing to give the landlord, typically the more money he's willing to spend on those tenant improvements. There's another thing that comes into play with commercial leases, and that is known as a personal guarantee. See, you could go out and form an LLC or a corporation, and you could sign the lease and other documents as well as an officer of that corporation. And if that business did badly and was unable to pay its, its rent and other obligations, the owner of that corporation might shut that corporation down, maybe file bankruptcy, dissolve the corporation, and completely uh, be off the hook for the rest of the lease. Landlords know that, and they often demand a personal guarantee. A personal guarantee means that the officer of the corporation is going to sign not just as a corporate officer, but as an individual. And what that means is if the business were to file bankruptcy or to be dissolved in some way, the, uh, the business owner cannot hide behind that corporate structure. They would actually be personal, personally liable for the balance of the lease obligation. So a personal guarantee provides a lot of security to a landlord. And as I mentioned, in some cases, they insist on it as part of the lease negotiations. But in some cases, you might offer it up as a way to get better lease terms and conditions as well, um, because it does offer better security, peace of mind to the landlord. Another thing that you might wish to negotiate in your lease is the right to sublease. Um, some landlords are okay with this, some are not. Again, it becomes a point of negotiation. But are you willing, or, sorry, are you able, I should say, to take some of the space that you are responsible for and turn around and actually sublease that to someone else? To bring a second tenant into that space who might occupy a small part of, of your space. And then you'd be able to collect rent from that tenant as a way to subsidize your master payment. So that is known as subleasing and it is also part of negotiations. Another part of negotiations would be options to renew. So I do teach a segment on uh, lease options in class eight. Uh, for those of you who know about that class, um, if not, you might want to check it out. But in that segment, we talk about how lease options are unilateral or one-sided, meaning that the tenant is going to pay a certain amount of money in exchange for the unilateral right to extend the lease. So that would give the tenant the first right of, of option, if you will, to say, you know what, we're, we're happy here, we're comfortable in this space, our business is doing well, we would like to exercise our option to stay. Sometimes businesses, they have the capital, they have the track record, they have the wherewithal to sign very, very long leases. There are even businesses that will go out and sign a 99 year lease on a space. That is one heck of a commitment for most of us. Uh, a better plan for most businesses is to sign a shorter lease, typically in the three to five year range, but with an option or several options to renew. So think about that. If you are operating a business in a particular space and you're very successful, 
chances are you might want to stay. But when you come to the end of the lease term, if the landlord knows that you're successful, he can jack your rent through the roof, right? There's no protections in place in the state of Nevada. He can, he can take a $2,000 rent and turn it into a $12,000 rent, and that might put you completely out of business. So as a way to stave off that shock uh, of, of, of rent increase that could be coming down the road, and also as a way to not sign a very, very long lease, but a, a middle of the ground there would be those lease options. So signing a shorter lease just in case something goes wrong or you're not happy in the space, you're not stuck there forever and ever, but also there is a way with that option or with those options, if it's more than one, to stay in the space if the tenant is happy and successful there, all part of the lease negotiations. Here's something that um, can be overlooked if you're not careful when it comes to lease negotiations, and that is the days and hours of operation. So you can't assume that when you lease a, a, a space to run your business that you can just set your own hours. There are shopping centers, especially malls, that can limit the days and hours of operation. You need to be very mindful of that. There could even be a certain day or days of the week that you are required to close. Certain times you can't operate. You might have to shut down by a certain time of night. You might not be able to open until a certain time of the morning. Um, for some businesses, those can be really, really important. So remember to make days and hours of operation part of your letter of intent and part of your lease negotiations. Now, when we get into more prominent uh, places to operate a business, um, major casino properties, as an example, if you wanted to open, let's say, a retail store in a big casino, um, if you wanted to be in a, a major shopping mall, if you wanted to be in the district or town square or downtown Summerlin or some of those really upscale prestigious places to run a business, not only are you going to have to have the financial wherewithal and the credit and possibly the operating history to be approved because those places do not like vacancies, they do not like turnover. But you should also be expected, um, you should be expecting to provide a business plan as well. A business plan is a regular thing that occurs when you're looking to go into a prominent place. Maybe you're op opening a business in the airport as another example. And a business plan is usually put together by your attorney and your accountant working together. And again, this is going to provide not only um, evidence of financial stability, but operational stability, future plans, growth potential. It's gonna make the landlord feel a lot better. Business plans, as you can imagine, cost money, especially if you wanna do one correctly. So this is for bigger businesses operating in more prominent places. And um, one more thing I wanna mention on commercial leasing, Sometimes leasing commissions can be very, very substantial. Uh, at TR Realty, we've had a few leasing commissions in the six digits, uh, meaning over $100,000, right? Yes, just on a lease. Um, so don't be surprised if you're engaged in negotiating a significant lease like that, and part of those negotiations call for the leasing commission to be paid in installments. That's how big some of those commissions can be. Landlords don't want to go upside down, meaning when they collect rent and they collect security for move in, sometimes the commission that's owed to the agent exceeds those funds. That would put them upside down. Some landlords don't want to do that. And that's why sometimes they pay out those huge commercial leasing commissions in installments. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope it was informative for you. If you are licensed with another brokerage in Southern Nevada and would like to talk with me, please text me or visit our website. See you next time.